Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for what will be an odd semicircle talk with Bay Rate from Spiraloid, uh, amazing character creator, but also working on some amazing VR comic books, uh, and Ethan, who is at Lyft. Um, and we got together probably a year or so ago. Oh, and I'm Rick from Rewind. Um, we are an AR and VR studio, build a lot of content for Hollywood and tech companies like Lyft. Um, so what we wanted to do here today was just kind of run through a bit of what we've built. It's uh, just to lay some context. Uh, it's basically an entertainment platform that works in the back of the car through your iPhone or your iPad. Um, it all started probably a year or so ago. Um, Ethan and I have worked together for a while, and we kind of came together. I showed off some of the new tech. I think it was a HoloLens yep. specifically. And it just kind of opened our minds to the possibilities of immersive tech and not only how it works kind of in our houses and you know, in destinations, which is obviously being explored, but with Lyft, how, do things, how does it work in the back of the car where we can entertain people, um, especially in a world where uh, there's more autonomous driving, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I'll let you talk about that. Um, yeah, and you know, in a Lyft, you know, you're the rider and you're not actually doing the driving, and so there's this dead space. And we always look at that as how do you create something that's you know, engaging and entertaining. And you find a lot of times people are just like this on their phone. You know, and a lot of what Lyft has to do is about community, about interacting. So really what we wanted to do was figure out a way to create like a shared experience, you know, leveraging AR, VR, and experimented a lot of that and landed on AR because it's something that everybody in the car could experience at the same time. Yeah, um, and what drew us to the project is Ethan's done some amazing stuff with his amazing creative team at Lyft um, to immerse people in brands. Um, and so I'll have him tell you a little bit about what they did for Stranger Things. Yeah. So we you have a long history at Lyft of creating internally what we call magic modes or promo modes. But essentially in the Lyft app, we'll create a new ride type. And so there'll be Lyft Line, Lyft you know, Classic. And for Stranger Things, for example, we'd created Strange Mode. Um, we partnered with Stranger Things, and we essentially built these immersive haunted house cars on wheels. So there was a, you know, filming pe unsuspecting people in these cars and there's a, you know, animatronic demogorgon popping out of the ceiling and the driver barfs out a slug and, you know, just <laughs> all kinds of like freaking people out in like a fun, silly way. Yep. Um, do we have the... Yep. Um, another example you guys did was for Ghostbusters? Yeah, so for Ghostbusters, we um, essentially, for the release of the reboot, um, you know, partnered with Sony and replicated, you know, in real life something like 25 replica Ecto-1s and let people take a ride in ghost mode and, you know, there was um, key lime slime Twinkies and Ecto cooler and all kinds of fun gags in the car. But with all of these things, you can imagine the cost and the overhead and the complexity of literally building, you know, 25 replica Ecto-1s and sourcing old Hearsts and, and things like that. And so really, what, what we started thinking about is like how could we take these partnerships, take these experiences, and how do you scale these things? And how do we leverage technology? You know, and the, the ultimate goal being you know, every single person with a lens on their phone, we could Slimer could be in the car, and you're driving around, and we can turn that on for every single Lyft user. So it's not just you know, a select couple hundred or couple thousand people in any city who could experience it. Because in a world like this, it's really more about like the teaser trailer video we make than the actual people getting to do it. I mean, that's great, but you just can't scale that effectively. And so we saw the work that everybody's doing, you know, with XR and gaming on Unity, and it's like, how could we, you know, Rick and I go way back, and he kind of started planting the seed and started trying to figure out what we could do. Yep. Um, and, Bay, do you want to, we were just talking out there, you have an <laughs> awesome story about how you came to the, yeah. to the project um, yeah, so from I, a creative and character standpoint. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I, uh, I do like 3D graphic novels and I build characters for movies and uh, video games and stuff. And um, basically, before I came down to uh, the Unity Summit a few years back, I ended up having uh, this experience on, on a journey where I got stuck on the side of a mountain and, as a snowstorm was bearing down and I had to be rescued by a snowmobile. Um, and basically, uh, I had a little tiny dog who's like my co-pilot, my best friend, and I stuffed him in a backpack and climbed onto the back of a snowmobile and held on for dear life as a very angry police officer took me 30 miles through the snow while uh, a huge blizzard was burying my, my vehicle in the snow. And uh, I basically was like, fast forward a few years, uh, and he had passed away, and I met Saul and these guys, and they were like, hey, you know, your, your buddy just, just, just moved on to to wider pastures, and we have this project where we think it could be really cool to put a companion 
AI in a car with you. And I was like, I will put what I'm doing on hold <laughs> and I will try to figure out a way to make that happen because that creatively and sort of tugged at my heartstrings, you know, because we all have a co-pilot in our lives and that we love and care about. And that, that idea of this character being a little bit more magical than you might actually be able to do in flesh and blood. And for me, it was like, okay, how could I pay homage to this crazy adventure that I've had with my buddy? Yep. So I, I was like, I love Lyft, and I was like, okay, yeah, let's, let's give this a shot. It sounds interesting, because it's a new kind of stage. Nobody's ever tried this before, and I'm one of those pioneering spirits who's like, yeah, it's impossible, sounds awesome, let me lend my shoulder. And, so. and like one of the things that, kind of the way we talked about it is that we essentially here have a roller coaster on wheels, and we control where the car is going, we control the audio, we control the visual, you know, every single component of what's happening. It's like, how can we build this and scale this and create yeah, something I mean, that's super like, magical? The thing that's really cool is that you know where the person's going, you know where they're coming from, yep. and unlike a movie theater or at your house, we could potentially control the environment physically where they are, right. um, which is this awesome interplay between the physical world and the optional world, um, which is really cool. And this is all the stuff that really, the, like the hard thinking that needs to go into back of car entertainment. So uh, with that, let's show them what we did. We'll kind of break it down in a, in a couple different sections, um, kind of walk you through the actual nuts and bolts R&D effort that this is to try to figure out how you can create a magical character, tell an amazing story in the back of a car. Um, so there's a couple ways that we think, from a Rewind tech perspective, there's a couple things we could have done, either VR or AR, we tested both. Um, VR, obviously from a storytelling standpoint, is a bit easier because everything is fake. It's masking the entire world. The challenge is, uh, as we went through when we first did, I think we did the first consumer experience for Red Bull on the DK1, um, we were able to pe make sure people didn't get sick five, six years, five years ago. Uh, which was really hard to do, you put it in a car and you have all those problems all over again. Um, reason being that sort of the, the inside out tracking stuff does not work that well in a moving car. Um, but uh, so anyways, but from a storytelling standpoint, really awesome because you can basically take, transport someone from the back of the car to a magical carpet flying through any world on the planet. Um, those are the types of executions you can do and they're believable. Um, I guess I'll get into the details in a sec. Um, the flip side is, is AR. So saw huge potential around AR, especially, you know, we have a HoloLens mocked up here, but also even be allowing people to open up a device that they own and use today. Um, every Lyft rider is using a phone because it requires an app. And to, so to empower them to be able to experience this world um, was kind of a dream. We and, and you could even imagine, outside of pure entertainment, like where you could take this, and it kind of gets into, very practical things like if you're in a lift ride, it being a guide and telling you about the city around you through that lens. You mm -hmm. could imagine it tying into wayfinding. So when you've been matched with a lift, conceptually, say you get off a plane in the airport, you know, you could follow breadcrumbs or whatnot to the pickup drop off location. And yeah. so this project was like, let's get started and start trying to figure all that stuff out. Yeah. Um, where it clicked for me was actually during the R&D phase, where I was riding around in a car that, we, that out, was outfitted with VR. It, the road and the map that I was seeing in VR was fully mapped to the physical world. So when we took a left at a stop sign, I, in the, the fictional world, I went around the corner to the left. And the moment for me where I realized this is probably part of the future of, enter, of uh, back of seat entertainment, but also transportation was, we'd come up on this sort of road construction zone. And I don't know if you've taken it. I don't drive a ton. I live in San Francisco. But when I do, if there's road construction or traffic, I, it's stressful. And that stress was coming up. And I was kind of going back and forth. And as soon as I put myself back in VR, where there was no construction, even though the car had slowed and kind of came to a crawl and had to go out around these potholes, the reality was I felt no stress because I was back in my magical world tuning into my story. So um, it was that kind of testing so as we went through that where it really clicked mm -hmm. for me. Where I could see this being a major, meaningful platform in the future. Just to jump in there on, the, on one thing that's interesting for me when I saw this when, they were, when I first came to the project was, uh, as a storyteller, this presents an, inter an interesting sort of gap that you have kind of in gaming, which is where you have elastic time, where you don't know how long uh, yep. the runtime is. So if you're working on animation, you have a fixed amount of time. If you have a game, you have a puzzle that you're trying to get through. But there's these, there's these two clocks, the movie clock and the game clock. And the ride clock is actually a different kind of clock. Um, and so if you're trying to think of like, oh, we have a detour. This, this, ri this ride that we're going to take is not going to be five minutes. It's now going right. to be 25 minutes. Or it's going to change drastically. And so suddenly that idea of like, oh, right, we have to plan for time itself in a very different way because of 
road construction and, and the, yeah. the, those little bumps you hit along the way that actually make the journey more interesting like a snowmobile. Yeah. So these are some of the challenges that we faced. Um, basically, we broke it down into a few different steps where uh, we sort of took the tech R&D, made sure we could make the platform work, and make sure that characters could stay in the car and not fly off into outer space. We then jumped into character design. Um, once we had a character we felt like people would fall in love with, went into story design, ultimately assembled it as part of the app building process. And then because we did, had a bunch of 4D elements and we actually built out a stage in the back of a car that the digital character could trigger, um, we got into sort of you know, experience assembly, if you will. So let's run through that. Um, a couple quick things. I won't spend a ton of time on this. These devices, out of the box, don't work in a car. Um, HoloLens is just, for, what, for a lot of reasons, it, the camera doesn't know if it should be tracking the world that's going 60 miles an hour or the car around you because it's always scanning. It's uh, inside out tracking. So that makes it incredibly difficult for that device to keep up. Oculus, obviously, you have a PC in the back of the car, but from a tracking standpoint, uh, it's IMU, gets all screwed up, and you get really, really sick. Um, and then AR Kit and AR Core, uh, your characters will fly off into outer space because they are, it, they, it's a device engineered for static ground. It doesn't know what to do when a, a car is stable to its view, but the accelerometers are all saying we're going 60 miles an hour. Um, Obviously, a very interesting and bizarre R&D process. Uh, Rewind is based just outside London. Uh, so for all of you thinking this is a person driving with a VR headset on the wrong side of the car, that is not right. Uh, <laughs> super dangerous, um, but still bizarre for, for fellow Brits to be seeing uh, a, a team of developers cruising around on the highway in VR headsets. Uh, there's also a lot of bizarre office rigs that got built uh, to be able to test. Uh, what we're testing here ultimately is how can we make the headset aware of where it is relative to the car and then the car aware of where it is relative to the world. Um, it turns out a constellation system is kind of how you do that. But there's a lot of moments like this, uh, literally being pushed around the office in a push cart. Uh, Notice I, the, uh, the, the video flickering um, where the, the sensors can't tell if he's turning his head or if the, the vehicle is turning. Yeah, That's one the, comes up right as he goes there, around this corner. There. You can the, kind of see that glitch. That's the, that's that, the problem. That'll make you throw up. <laughs> um, so this is all kind of part of the process to get the platform solid. Um, once we'd figured out VR, which we did get it to a point where it absolutely worked, um, we started looking at AR. Um, again, same problem. The device IMU won't work because it thinks you're on solid ground. Um, but even, I mean, even in these little like concept mocks, we just fell in love with this. It. It's like, if you can make this character jump around your car and know what elements of the car are there and interact, it's, it's going to be magical. Um, here's a quick demo of just a, a very terrible looking uh, paper marker. Um, but ultimately, the solution is you make the camera really smart. And you can then override reliance on the IMU. Yeah. And so the, the car turning right there and not glitching out is the central reason to, yep. to and go that, And that logo staying in the car relative to where, yeah. where your device is. Um, so with that, we jumped into character design. Uh, I think, yeah. do you want to talk a bit about, well, I can give some background. So um, working with uh, the Lyft creative team, we kind of come up with some early concepts. Um, they had an absolutely magical story. Um, mm -hmm. And this was an evolution that took a bit of time. Um, but basically, it was the amazing Lyft creative team, um, our Rewind uh, technical creative team, and then we brought Bay in. Mm -hmm. um, over the top to kind of run this whole thing. And uh, I'll let you walk through kind of the evolution of characters. Yeah, so when I first started, they, um, the, the, the Lyft team had sort of had this idea of a, a mayfly, um, because they only live for a short period of time. And so they sort of have this, 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 uh, this idea that you would sort of move through your journey along with this character's existence. Um, and so we did a lot of these sort of designs of like, how do we build this sort of affable, likable character that, that, that is an insect that doesn't get you the heebie-jeebies, but, but it conveys that idea that life is a journey to be enjoyed. And, and we sort of had a very sort of lofty goal of how we wanted to sort of let that story play out. Um, but any creative process usually involves a lot of exploration. And so um, one of the things I've learned, I've worked on The Lord of the Rings, building Gollum's face. I worked in Valve for a long time, making various Valve games, and I make my own stuff. And it's, it's always a journey. You always try a lot of different things. You sort of scatter shot and look at what is getting the reaction that you like and sort of simmer and let it come, you know, let it sort of boil up to the surface. So we, I like to do a lot of iterations. So this is uh, a version that's basically uh, based on sort of my, my, my furry pal. And so we, uh, we went through and did a bunch of these little tests. 
the one that's second from the right on the top, there's a little guy uh, holding a game pad and the idea that this character would have its own inner life, that he'd be doing something, not just standing there being cute, but actually have something going on, really grabbed us. Um, yeah, go to the next one. Uh, and so we started uh, realizing that we should, you know, robots are kind of the theme here. Uh, we live in a time when, when things are sort of shifting towards autonomous vehicles and robots, and how do we build a robot that's not covering the same tired ground that we've all seen, but how do we make this an interesting new way of sort of approaching um, a, a robot in a car. And so we did some of these early sketches to sort of find what is the thing that feels inviting and, and gets you into it. And we started noticing that the eyes of these particular designs, if you go to the next one, uh, start to look and feel a little bit like, oh, it's out of, it's, it's, yeah, ready to go to this one. They start to look and feel a little bit like uh, the eyes on the lift, can you go back one? Or that's a loop, okay. Um, but basically it's the amp in the lift vehicle uh, sort of looks a little bit like a robot. And so that idea of a traveling robot sort of grabbed us. Um, and ar around this time, I actually take a lot of lift vehicles myself. And I got into one where a father had been driving around and his daughters had drawn over the inside of the car and covered the entire <laughs> interior with stickers. So there was just butterflies on all the windows. And I get in, it's a big truck, and, and the guy looks at me and goes, daughters. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and, I, and I, had a, I had a charming ride, but I, I remember just sitting there thinking about it. I'm like, yeah, you know, that's part of the thing about this life being a journey that you want to sort of enjoy the ride and, and, and embellish it. And so that idea of, of a robot who travels, who's been to weird places and collects stickers. And so the one on the left there, we really gravitated towards and really liked this idea of the sort of funky, little Muppety kind of feeling robot guy. Um, these are some great designs done by uh, Igor Blackfrog. Um, and so we basically went through and came up with this little, this little guy who's kind of a version of the lift amp mixed with this traveling robot covered in stickers. Um, and then we realized that it'd be easier if he could fly around the car. <laughs> um, and so having him move around a little bit, so it was like a hovering version, we changed the eyes to sort of, uh, these ones are kind of interesting because they have the same exact LED layout as the amp that the lift amp has. So we could have programmed those eyes to blink like that in the back of a lift car. And that sort of got us thinking like, oh wow, the, the car itself is a robot, we should really explore that. And so we started pushing around this idea of more of different kinds of traveling robots that are you know, hovering. Um, what, what else could we do? These are some great ones done by Chocolate Soup. Well, I think what's really interesting there also is just this is the level of thought and detail it comes to figuring out a new platform and a new medium. Mm -hmm. uh, film's been around a long time. I think the tropes of how you tell a story in that space are really obvious, but um, really interesting for, for us from on the tech side was just understanding what thought went into the creative and story side to make sure that these characters in their, just even in their physical design, we're gonna limit our abilities to tell a story and have them interact in the right way in the back of a car. Yeah, we started out thinking that the characters were gonna be a certain size and have a certain relationship because you're sort of used to seeing them in animation. And then once we actually did some tests, we saw that people just immediately took their phones and just jammed it up. As you see, like out in the, in the AR gallery outside, you get, you get in close, you want to you wanna see them and the ones that react to you. And so it starts yep. to influence your design. Um, so these are some, some design experiments on the face. Um, I'll going. take a quick shameless plug. We also built the, um, the AR app out there for the gallery. Um, but if you go check it out, some of the tricks that we learned here make those characters sort of animate and connect to the space and use your camera in smart ways. So this, is, this, this little guy was the one sort of rose to the top for us. We liked the idea that he was like a character who sort of lived inside of a Jeffrey's tube that sort of magically connected all of the different Lyft vehicles. Um, during this whole process, the creative team at Lyft and I and, and the folks at Rewind would, would spend a lot of time sort of realizing that there's all sorts of interesting sort of ride-based entertainment things to explore in terms of like, you could leave a note in your Lyft vehicle for your grandmother in her Lyft vehicle in a different city and you could have this persistent spatial relationship with each other that just, yeah. it's, there's like this evergreen field of things of like, we know you're going to a movie theater so we're gonna right. show you because the Fandango app talked to the Lyft app and we're gonna show you Star Wars characters because you know your kids are about to see Star Wars and we know you're coming home from a, a restaurant and you yeah. just left, left a good review so your character is stuffed and you know what I mean? Like yeah. all these different ideas and we're like, oh my gosh, like throw a rock. This is a new stage craft that is not from a technical point of view but also from a creative point of view. So this idea of connecting all these little guys together through these Jeffrey's tubes brought us to this character. And that's kind of one of the things that attracted us to AR versus VR and be able to kind of leave these Easter eggs from ride to ride and the whole concept, like when we look at a Lyft experience, you know, in our competition with Uber and other competitors, like ride sharing really is a commodity. It's like in the end of the day, it's getting you from A to B. So it's like, how do we create an experience that makes you, gives you an affinity to Lyft? 
And what we found is that human interaction and human connection is like the number one indicator of a memorable experience that gives you like an emotional affinity to a product. And so a lot of this stuff was beginning to experiment with like how can we, again, like leaving digital love notes, you know, in AR in a car for the next person behind you to find or, you know, the driver, you give them a good tip and, you know, AR stars appear in the car. And there's so many things you can do. Mm -hmm. And so it was just kind of starting to just like tip of the iceberg of like how we can create an experience with that. Yeah, and just because that's a, such a part of the Lyft DNA to have right. that connection and that just delightful experience right. um, and your experience with characters. I mean, I think that's what sort of brought this together in a really soulful way was that it, like the, the spirit was absolutely right. Yeah. And if you, if you sum up the brief for this whole project, it boils back to like life's about the journey, not the destination. Mm -hmm. And so this journey and how do we make, create this narrator character that you fall in love with that shows you that journey. Yep. And so as we went forward, we, we, we started mocking that up in the car. And you can see the stickers from, the, from my ride with the, the, the five-year-old girls with their butterflies. Um, but we started realizing that this, it, that this embellishing the journey is, is sort of bleeding out from just, not just the character and not just the, the AR experience, but we needed to actually start to think about how it affects the inside of the car, not just as a, a blank stage, but as a, a themed stage that's part of the fiction. How does the story that comes into the real world uh, touch you in a way that you couldn't do watching an animation on a, on a flat screen or, or being in VR. Um, how, do you, how, how do we get the stuff to sort of escape from the box and make you realize that like, I don't know what's gonna happen next because I'm inside a robot and the robot could be messing with me. Yeah. And so, and so this, this mock-up in particular sort of made us realize like, oh yeah, we, we have this, this amazing boundary between the spotlight and the stage and we're, we're gonna have this character go back and forth between being up here where I am with on stage talking to you under the lights to being behind you messing with you <laughs> and yeah. talking in your ear. And that, that, this boundary here is, is, is very different inside of a car. And so we, we started exploring some of that um, and the magic that that implies that there's a lot more things that this character could do and so we should create some sort of spectacles, some shows and some tricks. And that's where we kind of came back to this idea of just very basic sort of old school vaudevillian stagecraft which is like, we wanna show people a magic trick and we want them to be like, this is a new kind of magic trick that is one part robotics, one part AR, one part lift vehicle, right. <laughs> and, and really play right on this boundary line. And so we sort of leaned on this idea of a new kind of magic trick. Um, and so we started exploring sort of a theatrical themed sort of magic versions of a robot. And obviously we're building all this for Unity and building it in 3D, so these are some of the, the behind the scenes, um, building some of the stuff with the auto mesh characters. And here's our, our uh, final design of the character. Uh, you can see he's got a little robot backpack as a little homage to my pal. Um, and he's basically, you know, a, a one part robot, one part sort of uh, central ringleader, sort of mage, magey kind of guy. And we wanted to sort of give him a little bit of that old sort of blues club showmanship kind of feel, but have him look like he's, he's, he's been places and he's got a story to tell. So this was our, this was our, our design that the team came up with and we're really, really happy with this guy. Yeah, and it felt like the perfect kind of magical, whimsical, character that could tour you through this new world, um, especially as we're testing this as a platform, because the, the grand vision would be ultimately, it'd be awesome if any IP could reach millions of right. users um, through this platform. Mm -hmm. um, so then once we'd had sort of the, the character locked, it came time to create a story. Um, we can... Oh yeah, this is the, so this is the sort of the, the idea of that magic trick. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to think of like, what's the thing that this character could do that you couldn't do any other way? And we really gravitated on this idea that we would give you a physical totem, a, a coin, or something that you could hold in your hand that you would push through the looking glass, the character would mess with it and then give it back to you at the end. And so we were like, how do we pull that off? And we're like, we could build a robot that could make an, a thing disappear and go into AR, and so if you look at this, the character, basically, the, you get into the car, someone mysteriously hands you a coin, you get into the car and the car has been decked out to feel like a, a theater, uh, you sit down and as soon as you click the seatbelt, the circuitry in the car lights up and the car dims and you're like, oh, the stage is set, yeah. ready to begin. Yeah. And there's the coin that you've been given and the, the AR tablet in front of you has been mounted to the stage and if you take the coin and drop it into the top, if you go to the next slide, um, it, this is, the next little slide here is basically, as soon as you drop it into the top, what actually happens is the coin drops through the handle and goes into the base and disappears. And an AR version of the exact same coin falls through and is now an AR, rolls around on stage and forms this little bubble where our character sort of appears. And so that idea that you've basically been sort of, and this is the, 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 the training part where we have to teach you how to hold the how to hold the AR device, how to look around. Um, so there's a little bit of game design here. So while the character is sleeping, you're basically 
being told by uh, the narrator who's sort of speaking over the top to you know, pick up the device, <laughs> look around, tap the screen, um, sort of the, the getting, getting you oriented. Yeah. But and it's then, a really good example of how story can cover for technical needs, right? So in order for the device to know where it is and where to place these objects, you actually do kind of have to get the person to look around a bit so that the camera can say, oh, I know where I'm, I am. I'm in this car, and I need to place characters in these five places. Um, but by building it into the story, it doesn't feel like it's a standard sort of, you know, the, the awful clippy yeah. sort of word kind of narration of how to use the thing. It's just, it's seamless. You're, you're doing what we need you to do yeah. I in mean, a story. It's, it's, it's game design 101, which is that you, you want to make your upskilling fun. Right. And you want to teach them one thing and then have that build on the next thing and the next thing. Um, and so the idea here is we, we sort of started out with how do, you, how do you look, how do you tap, and then basically the character comes up and does some little magic tricks for you. <laughs> Uh, and then he starts to sort of push himself outside. This is basically just designing to get you to look around so that you're not just aiming it at the center. So as he moves around the car, we've actually placed Vuforia markers. Uh, if you look on the bottom left there, um, the idea is that we've, there's a Vuforia marker on the center stage where you're looking at him, but the rest of the car has also got sort of art-themed Vuforia markers all around it so that as you look around, yeah. you never lose tracking inside the car. So the stage yeah. is sort of serving a twin purpose, one, to make you feel like you're in, a, in a, the most awesome home theater you've ever been in, and two, it's giving us tracking markers so we can see everything. Because if you think about it, in the back of a car, it's the nightmare situation for tracking because lights from other cars <laughs> are moving around outside the windows. So you have this, like, not only is the car moving and there's these AR and IMU problems, but now you've got all the stuff that makes the Vuforia markers work is now being dealt with as strobe lights and fluorescent yeah. lights and headlights and yeah. sirens and everything else. So it's like, it's the chaos situation for trying to, to solve these problems. So. Yeah. But even there, like partnering with Smart Creative, we're able to hide the technical requirements of a marker inside the narrative. So yeah. when you get in the car, it just looks like a beautiful design. Yeah. What, what the naked eye can't tell is that there's effectively a bunch of QR codes hidden there, but you, would, you can't pick up on it. It's just a and, unique and, design. And so as we do these magic tricks, um, the, he it ignites this sort of fire tornado, and we've actually got uh, LED arrays wired all around the inside of the car. So you're essentially inside a, a crazy electronic disco. <laughs> and so as you move the tablet around, the, the tablet knows where it, it is, and it's communicating to the Arduino system in the car to light up LEDs on the wall, almost like you have a flashlight, but there's no, there's no flashlight in, the, in your hand. And so when he does something, there's ripples happening on the walls and in the car around you. So when this tornado happens, we were going to put, uh, the idea here is on the base of it, we're, to put uh, giant fans, so not only is it hot, but we're gonna mess up your hair and really get you, like, so when he's going, oh my God, like you're in the car going, wait, I'm inside a blender, <laughs> and this, this is going nuts. And so that idea, we really wanted to get you that feeling that the, the difference between your world and the world that he was, was totally, the, 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 the veil has come down. Um, and so right at the very climax when everything is just going totally crazy and you're like, this is really loud. I'm sitting on a 10,000 watt subwoofer that's vibrating my teeth and the wind is blowing me in this hot air and there's stuff on fire and he's, oh my God. And then it goes, boom, cuts to black. And when you cut back up, the coin that you dropped is on the stage. And that's where the robot has actually done a little <laughs> and put the coin right dead center of the stage. And so when you look at it, there's all that's left is the coin and the door opens because you happen to have just arrived at your destination. So it's a coordination of the two things together. So the end of the show, ladies and gentlemen, the big bow, the big boom, here's the magic trick, and you're off on your next show. Hope your date goes great. Highly confused, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. <laughs> so I don't know that we need to show the animatic, probably. No, we can probably skip that. I just did it out loud right now, so yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Same thing. You just missed a video where Bay voice acted what you just heard. Yeah. Um, so when it came to building the app, uh, obviously uh, very involved in this as well, but we did mocap this. Um, Bay, do you want to give a little? I'm wearing the same clothes, so obviously I travel in He time. just came from there. This is all shot today. <laughs> This is, this is actually... He's uh, the Steve Jobs of his craft. Yeah, right. this is the I'm going to wear this, this out forever now. Totally. Uh, this, is, this is Maya Nichols. She was actually a French Haitian dancer who knew a whole bunch of really interesting different kinds of dance. Um, and we knew we wanted to do this as a mocap, motion edited, keyframed kind of thing. And when she came in to audition, she did uh, a Balinese hand dance to Frank Sinatra. And we were like, this woman can really move really well. <laughs> and so um, we, we basically built that little stage. So the tape marks that you see there on the, on the stage are the, the, approximately the size that she is. And this mocap facility up is mocap now up in Seattle. And they have a balcony. 
And if you stand up in the balcony and look down on her, you're essentially at the same place that you would be in the car holding the tablet looking at her. So I would basically run up and down the stairs and look down at her and get, do the direction. And it was, it was pretty interesting. And we also had the character sort of set up. You can see this is sort of a, a, a traditional sort of mocap kind of environment here. But we had a lot of coordinated tricks that we had to do in time. Um, so there was a lot of very sort of art, very, very intricate sort of stagecraft where she had to hit her marks and do sort of the sleight of hand bits, uh, which was kind of fun to work on. Uh, this is just raw mocap. I'm kind of see the, the end result. Um, and we also, uh, we also could have done this all in 3D as well. I think in this case it was a timing issue. It was faster to get it in by doing mocap. Um, but the, because of the, the power of real-time engines now, you can absolutely um, also do this stuff digitally um, and have just really informed characters. We think that's such a huge part of making connection with a customer. And, and since we're at the Unite, um, this was all done in timeline. So we were actually in Unity cutting the animatic together so that when we actually started putting in the clips of the mocap, we were actually literally just using timeline and jamming the timeline clips together. So the difference between our storyboards, instead of normally being done in sort of Premiere or, or, or Final Cut, were actually done in timeline inside Unity so that we could literally just do all of our audio scrubbing and tracking and mocap blending all within that one same environment. So basically our storyboard sort of grew seamlessly from being uh, a 2D storyboard that you'd see in a normal 2D sense into the final app. Um, so the actual Unity playables are actually what the app was made of at the end, uh, which is and no small thing for those of you who are into, into the Unity side. Yeah. Um, we can show just some, some quick test footage. It's a little bit blown out, but this was sort of our first, first go at tracking this story with a tracker in a, in a dark space. Um, but this is kind of starting to see the character come to life and starting to see kind of what's, what's happening overlaid on your real world. It's just a, a really awesome uh, experience to start seeing all this hard work and character design start to actually animate in your world. It's, it's kind of a special part of building. Um, so let's talk a bit about the experience. I think we've got 10 minutes, so we'll fire through this and yeah. maybe there's time for questions. Um, so we started mocking up the, the physical stage in this, of course, sort of Ethan's forte in terms of how to design magical stages and in the back of a car. Um, I want to be clear, like the intention here is to build an actual physical car that looks like this. So, um, you know, certainly as a first go, we felt like we had to, to build the most premium yeah. experience. Yeah, and Bay got into a lot of this, but really marrying like the practical effects with the digital and creating almost this like 4D experience was we're how we thought we could really differentiate it and make it really special. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we went through a bunch of iterations. This is actually getting pretty close to kind of where we ended up finally, um, obviously as a mock. Um, but it, you know, we, we kind of erred on the side of s subtle accents with a whole bunch of action coming through AR um, in the back of the car, which just kind of pulled it together in such yeah. a, a perfect and magical way. There's markers. And so one of these slides, we're going to show you the actual final thing. So it's that one. Gotcha. Um, anything else you guys want to say just in, t in terms of the getting to this point where we can kind of show you what it became? But Yeah, I mean, the, the, so in this one here, the, the, the floor is actually an infinity mirror, and so are the windows. And so the idea was is that during that final uh, overstimulation, blow your hair off, kind of thing. <laughs> we wanted to have the LED ropes that you see sort of lighting up and responding to where you're looking. We wanted to have the wind going, but we also wanted to have the floor sort of drop out and the windows sort of, sort of just really just sort of do something that you couldn't really do in any mm -hmm. other way. That roller coaster in the back of a car kind of right. thing of like, okay, we, we want to blow your hair back. Yep. Um, and, and the idea too of, of really setting this as a kind of stage for, for anybody. Um, so this is kind of like a New Orleans jazz kind of club right. kind of theme. Um, and that idea is that you know, the mage and the story and the character that we've got here is just one type of event. You can imagine um, an infinite variety of kids shows to horror things to yeah. anything happening on this kind of stage. And so we really wanted to think of it as like, this is a new kind of stage and we wanted to sort of impart that idea in your minds and in the minds of people who have this experience that this is uh, sort of pulling back the curtain on a, on a totally different kind of stage that can take it off of Broadway and bring it to Main Street in a really interesting way, um, which is kind of the thing that really got us all really excited about the, this, this avenue to explore, uh, which was really cool. You know, to echo that, you know, at Lyft we're constantly approached by, you know, movie studios and different IP partners to implement this sort of thing, and we're always trying to, like, level up what we're doing. So, you know, fabricating Ecto-1s is one thing. This is, like, how do we 
go to the next level. You know, if you think about Lyft, like our unique data that we have is like we know where you are, we know where you're going. And so how do you customize that? You know, if you go into a movie premiere, you can be doing a ton of things, but like how can we create this immersive experience based on that data? Yeah. yeah. And I can't speak for Lyft, but I know from, from because we dabble in a whole bunch of technology at Rewind, um, the exciting future to think about is, is a potentially autonomous driving future where there are themed cars and cars have different functions. And when you're not the driver and you don't have to focus on the road, what are the things that will not just make the journey better, but more productive and more entertaining? Um, you know, it, are there, will, will you actually want to take longer rides because there's something you're doing in that car that makes you actually want to spend more time in that environment? Mm -hmm. um, those are the types of questions we're really interesting, interested in, in figuring out um, in this new future. And for us, we think it is ultimately a meeting of all of these different technologies to turn into something like this that's super accessible, super usable. It's very scalable. So honestly, I mean, we created our own IP on this one. But um, to your point about Hollywood Studios being yeah. interested, anyone that wants to tell a story in the back of the car because of the learning in this R&D process could come to us and actually, you know, we could make this work. Um, make this functional, and it could be, become a staple in, in anyone's cars, really. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I want to show you a trailer of, of kind of what we ended up building. Oh, could we get the sound up on this? So that's what we have for you. Thank you guys so much for taking the time. I've been told that Q&A happens out there. So uh, we'll stand around, stick around for a bit and mm -hmm. answer any questions you have. But really appreciate your time. Again, uh, on behalf of Lyft and Bay at Spiraloid, uh, Rick at Rewind, just really excited uh, yeah. to be able to share this, this sort of R&D effort with you. And uh, we are super excited about the future of transportation and ideally entertainment in the back of a car. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Rick.